Kentucky Congressman James Comer has Democrats against the wall again. Comer is demanding answers surrounding Kamala Harris's running mate, Tim Walls, and his connections to China. Comer subpoenaed the beleaguered Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas concerning a whistleblower's allegation that Walls' China relationship goes way deeper than just a series of classroom trips and honeymoons. In a letter accompanying the subpoena released on Thursday, Comer said the House Oversight and Accountability Committee received information from a whistleblower about, quote, serious concerns amongst the Department of Homeland Security personnel regarding a supposed long-standing connection between Tim Walls and the Chinese Communist Party. At this time, we do not have any exact details put forward by the whistleblower. Comer's subpoena gave a deadline of October 7 to produce the communication in the Microsoft Teams group chat relating to Walls as any intelligence on Walls' activity as governor or his staff. With the New York governor's former deputy chief of staff exposed herself as a Chinese government agent, this can prove a serious headache for Minnesota and Harris if the investigation proves fruitful. But has this alleged CCP connection already spread to the Harris campaign at large? Joining us now is best-selling author and investigative journalist Seamus Bruner. Seamus, welcome back. Yeah, hey, Chanel, it's great to be with you. This is big news from James Comer. Uh, it's always good to get whistleblowers telling us what's going on on the inside. And it's very encouraging to hear that even inside Alejandro Mayorkas's Homeland Security, there are agents concerned about uh, Tim Walls' deep and abiding ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, let's talk about those abiding ties. I mean, I know that you've been talking about these ties. Um, Peter Schweitzer has been talking about these ties. He's been talking about uh, some of the more uh, tangible connections that Walls seems to have with CCP entities. Talk to us about what that money side looks like, what those lines actually manifest as. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we've been looking at the uh, Chinese Communist Party's practice of elite capture for at least six years now. We've uncovered uh, so much on the Bidens, I mean, with the CEFC deal, and we broke news on the Dianne Feinstein, Mitch McConnell, Elaine Chao. We have looked at everyone at the federal level, and we have exposed all of their ties to China. The shocking thing is Tim Walls, it, he takes the cake for having the deepest, longest lasting ties to China. It all starts, I mean, 1989, early 1990s. He's doing these student trips. Uh, he's saying that they're giving him more gifts than he could ever take home. And the shocking thing about those old trips are that the Chinese Communist Party sponsored these trips. So that is a financial relationship. Tim Walls set up a company with his wife to take you know, hundreds of students on trips to China. On these trips, he told the American students to, quote, downplay their Americanness. So he uh, understands what the CCP wants. He doesn't, uh, this isn't a, like bringing students to China to learn about how communism is bad and look at how great we have it in America. He loves China's system. He loves the brutalist, brutal authoritarian system. He said a few bad things here and there, but not really. For example, he's never talked about the fentanyl crisis and how that has uh, killed hundreds of thousands of Americans, and it all comes from China. He doesn't talk about Xinjiang and the genocide happening in various parts of China. And so it's what the Chinese call big help with a little bad mouth. Now, fast forward to when Tim Walls becomes governor. He has all of these Chinese diplomats invited to his inauguration. He has gone on trips sponsored by groups that are very closely aligned with the CCP, uh, in the Twin Cities, there is a secret Chinese police station. Only seven cities in the country uh, have been found to have these secret Chinese police stations, which is where the CCP intimidates uh, dissidents and former uh, Chinese, now Chinese Americans. This hosted in Tim Walls' town, and it's hosted at an organization that is very cozy with Tim Walls. And so, yeah, of course, uh, there are people inside the government who are aware of these ties, and it's really encouraging to see them coming forward and telling us what they know. Not to mention, Seamus, and uh, Dan Schneider was on the show just yesterday. He made an excellent point. If you talk to anybody who has spent any time in China, 
Uh, there's a marked difference between being an American in the pre-Tiananmen Square massacre and the post-Tiananmen Square massacre. And if you were the pre-Tiananmen Square massacre times, China was a di very different place. You had a lot of dissent and a lot of Americans who found um, friendly voices, friendly faces there. Post-Tiananmen Square, the time that Walls ends up spending going to China and spending time there is a very different China, one that treats Americans in a very different light. And if you're there, it's because you basically support the CCP, not the other way around. Yeah, you're exactly right, Chanel. And uh, I'm I'm very happy that uh, uh, James Comer at the top of his letter included the line that the CCP views America as its number one enemy. We talk about adversary. A lot of people in Washington talk about rival or competitor. No, China views us as an enemy, and they are actually waging a war on us via fentanyl. And they even want our border open. Uh, and Tim Walls, by the way, a clip that came out today, talks about why the open border is such a good thing. He, he brags that Minnesota is the number one location of refugees, where people are speaking 50 different languages. Now, we're all for supporting refugees, but they have to come in uh, legally and they have to assimilate. Tim Walls doesn't want assimilation, and that's exactly what China wants, is to break us down into little groups and make us fight amongst each other. No, I mean, uh, talk to anybody who's in the Weibo chats over there in China, and the, you know, the CCP is actively encouraging people to comment about the downfall of America, the downfall of our entire way of life under the current regime. But um, what's interesting, too, is I think this is a pattern with the Democratic Party in particular, but it's not exclusive to them. The money trail of Chinese American donations that go to certain candidates, a lot of Chinese money has been caught going, being siphoned through donors on these political campaigns in these political uh, settings. What do we know about Walls's donor base from way back to 2006 when he first went to Washington? Yeah, Tim Walls is beloved by the Chinese American uh, community in uh, Minnesota. He gives speeches at the Chinese American Association of Mini of Minnesota. He's very close with that organization. They have funneled a lot of money to his campaigns. Now the problem is. Uh, if they're if they're dissidents, that's great. But if they're operatives, if they're Chinese spy operatives, as we know, he's attended multiple events and been the keynote speaker. He's received money from these groups that are run by Chinese spies. And so if Tim Walls is compromised, as it appears that he is, that's a huge problem. And that is what I believe the Homeland Security whistleblower is talking about. Interesting. So let's go to the topic of your latest book, Control Agarks, we've discussed before the evolving nature of the control agarks and where they stand politically. You've seen somewhat of a shift in big tech towards the right. You've seen Zuckerberg now declaring he's a libertarian. There's certainly a political shift. Talk about the money shift. Where do all of these big money types see the future and China. Yeah, well, they all love China. I mean, I won't say all of them. I mean, they say libertarian, but they absolutely support authoritarian type rules like censorship. I mean, they're big fans of censorship. And you can understand why when people have the power to silence their critics, there's an impulse to do it. And they act on it. Mark Zuckerberg has acted on it. Now, he's like to go back and say that, no, actually, I'm not. Uh, a censor, but he really is. And also, you know, Jeff Bezos says Amazon has done plenty of censorship on its own. The bulk of what, who I call the control oligarchs, and this would include George Soros and BlackRock's Larry Fink, and uh, a lot of the guys uh, in Silicon Valley, these uh, venture capitalists, a bulk of them are donating to the left. They always have donated to the left. I think it's probably uh, partially they're true believers in, uh, you know, having a monopoly on compassion. Uh, but another part of it is they do have authoritarian impulses. They do have a technocratic streak. That is that they believe that they know better than everyone else and that the voters are not smart enough to make decisions for themselves. So that's true. And that would include, let's say, Klaus Schwab, uh, Bill Gates, of course, who's recently talking about 
uh, using AI to censor misinformation and silence people who have any questions about uh, you know, mandatory vaccinations or stuff like that. Uh, so Bill Gates certainly falls into that category. But you're right, there is that. a small portion <laughs> of people like Elon Musk. And so, again, I applaud Elon Musk for all that he has done recently with the opening up of Twitter. I mean, some of the things that even Neuralink, which I write about in the book, which is, to me, a creepy technology, and, it, and I think it is in the long-term sense of putting microchips in people's brains. But some of the things he's done with this new blind site or helping paraplegics walk. I applaud him yeah. for all of those things. With that said, Elon Musk is a technocrat. He's a self, you know, he's a self-professed technocrat. He believes in, uh, you know, various systems. He thinks that engineers, and they are smarter than the vast majority of people in in some ways, but not in every way. And I and I believe, and I think you and you know this network believe, and the audience believes that the voters know what's best for them and their families. And so you can't have an oligarchy of tech bros telling us what to do, telling us what we're allowed to say. And so you're absolutely right. They've sort of diverted. There's a lot of money going to Donald Trump from some of these tech bros. Uh, but, you know, it, time will tell if, uh, if they get their way and they have this sort of technocratic system. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm a Jeffersonian in this regard, but the generally... Big systems in anything is generally a bad thing because it inevitably leads to corruption. It inevitably leads to that sultry siren sound of power that sings in every ear of every technocrat, every oligarch, anybody who has lots of reins in their hands. They start steering, thinking that they can steer the entire world. And that that's when things get scary. But... At the end of the day, Seamus, I feel like I would rather, if we are inevitably headed to a world that is controlled by AI, I would love to know that we have a few freedom-minded folks who at least understand it. And I think Elon Musk falls in that category. I'd much rather he be, in, be on our side than not. So, yeah, this is a, it's certainly an interesting and evolving field. Seamus, yeah, as I, always, I thank agree. you so much for the time.